You guys can have a seat, and uh, we're going to let you guys have a second to get the house lights back there in the back for us, and uh, so that you can see your Bibles. And if you would, uh, while they're doing that, go ahead and uh, pull them out to and turn to Luke chapter two. Uh, that's going to where that's where we're going to kind of key off of this morning. Glad you're in God's house this morning. Thanks, guys, for leading us uh, in worship. I don't give them enough props, but these two guys lead our. Uh, lead our worship ministry. Aaron is our worship leader, and Scott's our assistant worship leader, and they do an awesome, awesome job. And they gave everybody else the day off this week, and uh, just uh, it's awesome to have these guys that just lead us uh, to uh, to the foot of the cross every Sunday with God songs. Amen. Um, with with songs that are straight from the Scripture, I, I love it, and uh, it does my heart good, and I hope it does yours too. We're in uh, Luke chapter 2. Like I said, this is the third message in this series. And so we're going we're gonna to jump right in and, uh, and get done with it this morning and just see what God wants, us to, te- wants to teach us as we close out uh, this series. Uh, this series, like I said, has been called uh, Wise Men Still Seek Him. And we've talked about the prophecy of the birth of Christ, and then we talked about the actual birth of Christ last week. And we're not totally going to get away from that this morning, but I did feel like it was important for us to bring all that together and for us to talk about why the birth of Christ is important for us today. Why it's something that we should focus on more than just one time a year, more than just uh, that last week of December, and we, uh, we get all hyped up about it, and we talk about Jesus, and we have our Christmas services, and then we open our presents at home, and we come back and talk about we had a good Christmas, but then we forget what it's really all about. Um, and so I want us to talk about what the birth of Christ means to us this morning, and I think no other verse uh, speaks better than the actual uh, verse that tells us that Mary gave birth to Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Very simply this morning it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, I think we learn a lot, a lot that we can apply today and a lot that we can remember today, even from that verse. That's, that's the Christmas verse. That's the verse we read. That's the verse we teach our kids. And that's the verse we just skip over sometimes and don't see the depth of it and we don't see the meaning. But what, what do you learn from that verse? What, what do we need to take away from it uh, in these last few days of 2013 and walk forward in our lives? What should we keep on our hearts as we think about the birth of Christ? I think the first thing you see right there in that verse, it says that you'll find a baby. It says you'll find a baby. I think we need to never forget the humanity of Jesus Christ. We know from the Scripture, uh, the Scripture tells us in First John, it tells us in John, it tells us that Jesus Christ is God. We know that Jesus is God. We know that God exists in three ways. God the Father, God the... And God the... God can do that. He's God. He can exist in three ways. We can't. Uh, three in one. And we know that the Son is part of who God is. We know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And who is the Word? What is the Scripture? The Scripture tells us that. Who's the Word? The Word is Jesus Christ, and so we know that Jesus always has been. It's not something God just came up with all of a sudden 2,000 years ago and said, well, I think I'll do this to save mankind. God already knew. Um, Jesus already existed. And so the Scripture, you know, we know that. We know that God is sovereign. We know that, that Jesus is God. But sometimes we don't go to the depths to realize that Jesus, in that, his, that point in history during that time, that Jesus chose to become one of us, that God chose to come down and to take our place. So we need to never forget that that scripture says, you will find a baby. We need to never forget that the scripture shows us the humanity. I guess that's what I'm getting at. We should never forget the humanity of Jesus Christ. It says a baby, and in the Greek, you know what that word means? You know what it means in the Greek, that word baby? Get this, it means baby. That's what it means. It means infant or newborn. Uh, it's, it's a totally ordinary word used to describe the birth of a child. And, and this tells us that Christ came into the world just as we all do. To, to say that Christ was born as a baby brings us face to face with the truth of who Jesus really is. And the fact that God from all eternity came from heaven and took on humanity when he was conceived in Mary's womb and born in Bethlehem. 
He was not half God, and he was not half man, but he was fully God and fully man because God can do that. Amen, church? He did not cease to be God, although he laid aside the outward glory of his deity at that time. In some way, mysterious to us, the Lord Jesus Christ was the God-man, two natures joining together in one person. And this is the central truth of Christianity. If you want to know the central truth of Christianity, it's right here in this verse. God has entered human history in order to provide for our salvation. That's what God did for us. What we could not do, God did for us through His Son. Everything else in Christianity flows from this truth. Without this verse, there is no Christianity. If He had not been born, He could not have ever died for our sins. And He would not have risen from the dead if He had not died. He had to become like us in order to save us. There was no other way. Now, here's the, here's the bottom line. Many battles have been fought over this basic truth that we find in this Scripture. It may be easy for us in central Alabama to accept this truth, but many people, even in this nation and all over this world, reject this truth. In the first century, it even raged on. This battle raged on over the genuine humanity of Jesus Christ. Did God really become a man? Some people said no, but we have to look at the Scripture for our answers, don't we? 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. If you turn there with me for just a second. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It reminds us that to deny the humanity of Jesus Christ is to place ourselves outside the boundary of Christianity. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Get this. If you struggle with, with accepting some... And, and here's the deal. This really is unbelievable. Some people say, well, that just couldn't happen. But God can do the unbelievable. God can do the impossible. You have to have faith that God can do what God can do, not what, you know, and, and, and not put God in a human box and, and say, well, God has to be like us because God is God. He always has been, always will be. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. He's always existed and always will. And so God can do this. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. And here it is. Here it is, the Christmas story. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, church. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Wow. Pretty straightforward. That scripture reminds us that to deny the humanity of Jesus Christ is to place ourselves outside the boundary of Christianity. And this is what Christians believe because this is what God's Word teaches. This verse teaches us that the Lord from heaven entered this earth as a tiny, helpless baby. And so we see His humanity. Now back on Luke chapter 2. Back in that verse, in verse 7, not only do we see his humanity, but it says you'll find a baby, and it says he'll be wrapped in cloths. Well, that sounds good. That sounds like something that you talk about with a baby, you know, wrap him up in cloths. And, I, you know, I've, I've used this example before, but those of you just here in modern days, and it, things have changed a little bit. It was always like this somewhat, I guess. But uh, with my three kids, I know... We had our first two at CRMC, and Jake was born at St. Vincent's, and it was the same. They give this whole clinic on how to wrap that baby up in that cloth. You know what I'm talking about? They pull the dads aside and said, man, you're not going to be good at a lot of things, but you better learn this. And, they, and, and, and I did. My OCD little self, man, I could wrap a baby up. There's a lot of things I couldn't do, but I could wrap those babies up. Man, I was like, Phew. you know, I was going at it, and I'd wrap that baby up and say, here he is. You know, I could wrap him up, man. I was so good at it. I was giving clinic. I was charging other dads. They were coming down to our room, and I was giving a clinic and, you know, charging them five bucks a piece to learn how to wrap up their babies. And, uh, but the Scripture says that 
in this day, if you study, if you study history, that it was, it was kind of like that. It was a little bit different. They were wrapped in strips of cloth to protect them from the harsh elements. Uh, usually the mothers would wrap their arms and wrap their legs separately, and then they would wrap their torsos. I mean, think about like an Egyptian mummy or something. I mean, that's what it was like. It's kind of like that, uh, that Christmas movie, um, A Christmas Story, where the mom wrapped up the kid and he's trying to walk to school, you know, doing that. We did that to Jake last year when it snowed, and like he could barely move, and we had to start taking clothes off and redoing it because he was just so wrapped up like the Michelin Man. And, and that's what they did, and it seems kind of cruel because it totally would restri- restrict a child's movements. But you got to think about that day in a world where there was very little medical care, uh, when babies routinely would die before their first birthday because of, because of sickness and harsh elements. It, it was a way to provide a crude kind of protection uh, from the world around them. Now, you may say, well, what does that teach us today? What does it teach us? Well, I think we have to remember that from seeing that the, the Christ child was bound, that he was, that he was bound in swaddling cloths, and when we find the baby Jesus, it reminds us of another time in Jesus' life, years later, when he would stand before the Jewish authorities as a 33-year-old man, bound and guarded as if he was a common criminal. He was falsely accused. The Scripture says that when that happened, he made no reply. When he was mocked, he refused to answer. He stood before his accusers with his hands tied, awaiting the verdict that would end his life. And I believe that it's no coincidence that Jesus Christ entered the world just as he left it, helpless and bound. I mean, you look at, you look at the baby this way, no one can ever say that Jesus Christ, get this church, no one could ever say that Jesus Christ came only for the rich and powerful. He didn't. And no one could ever say that he used his heavenly power to make an easy entrance into the world and to exit out of it with no pain. That's not what God chose to do. He could have, but he didn't. He came not for the faith of a few, but he came to be the Savior of all. He, he was bound, church, so that we might be set free. The third thing that we see in the Scripture in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it says there will be a baby he's wrapped in swaddling cloths, and we would find him lying in a what? Find him lying in a manger. It sounds good. We say it in our Christmas plays. We, we talk about it all the time. And we've talked about what that manger really probably was like. But one problem I think that we have is that that word manger doesn't clearly communicate a real clear image to us. We, we tend to get our concept of mangers, like I said, from the storybooks we read and the pictures that we can draw. But the word itself means something like a stable or perhaps a feeding trough. In the first century, stables often, get this, often they were nothing more than just a circle of stones. Or sometimes it might have been in a hollowed out cave in the side of a hill, just a little place for the animals to feed. And we don't know for sure. Um, It could have been a wooden trough like we use sometimes in our plays, but it probably, it was not. It probably was made of stone. But whatever it was, I promise you this, it was not like one of those beds that you can adjust both sides. It was not a Tempur-Pedic. It wasn't the nice cribs that we buy for our babies before they're born, and, and then we convert it into a day bed, and then it converts into another bed until finally they've jumped on it so much it falls apart and we've got to buy them a new bed. It wasn't one of those. I mean, it was, it, it, it was a stone trough lying in a manger, And I believe there's prophecy there too. I mean, I think there's a hint of his upcoming death there too. I believe that there really is. Even in the feeding trough, I mean, think about it. This baby was bearing the only cross a baby could bear. Extreme poverty. He was under contempt. There was the indifference of mankind. There was no room for them in the end. In the words of Francis Assisi, here's what Francis Assisi said. He said, for our sakes, he was born a stranger in an open stable. He lived without a place of his own wherein to lay his head, subsisting by the charity of good people, and he died naked on a cross in the close embrace of holy poverty. This baby lying forgotten in an exposed stable, resting in a feeding trough. I mean, think about it. That's God's appointed sign to us all. It wasn't likely. It wasn't what people thought it would be. God came to the world in the most unlikely way, and we need to never forget that. 
that should impact us today. This is, this is what Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 means when it says that he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Nothing about the baby Jesus appeared supernatural that day. Nothing about Jesus appeared supernatural. Nothing screamed at me and screamed out loud, I'm God, look at me. Nothing about it. There were no fireworks going off in the stable that day. There was no big parade before Jesus was born. If you had been there and you'd had no other information, you would have just concluded that this was just a little baby born to a poor couple that was down on their luck and had nowhere else to go. Nothing about the outward circumstances pointed toward God. Nothing. Nothing about the poverty of the situation screamed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But there's always a but, isn't there? <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm looking at him. That's not what I'm talking about. Our God is full of great surprises. Our God is full of great surprises. I mean, this little baby boy is God. This little baby boy is the supreme being of all. This little baby boy is God of the universe. The scripture says that God is mysterious. We don't understand why he did it the way he did. We cannot tell by looking exactly why God does what he does. Romans 11.33 reminds us that his paths are beyond tracing out. Aren't you glad that the scripture never tells you that you've got to figure God out? God's God. He's, his ways are not our ways. His paths are beyond tracing out. God does what God wants to do. God is sovereign. He doesn't have to answer to us. You can look at the sky and you can see a star, but you can't tell where it came from or where it's going, can you? And the same is true of the God who made the stars. We see God at work in the world, but we cannot tell where he's been and what he'll do next. He's God and he's all-powerful. And to me, that is extremely reassuring to know that behind Christmas stands a huge God of greatness. He does what he wants. He doesn't ask for human counsel. And from our limited perspective, his ways make no sense at all sometimes. It doesn't make sense to me that Jesus, the God of the universe, would have to be born in a stinky manger. It doesn't make sense that he would come in poverty. It doesn't make sense but it doesn't have to. This is a great comfort because it reminds me that he is God and I am not and you are not. That he is God over all. And I believe that we could deduce from this one verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 7, a lot of things. And here they are. I'll just give you four. You don't have to write these down. You can if you want. I think we need to never forget today the depths to which Christ stooped when he joined the human race. We need to never forget the depths to which he stooped to join the human race. Secondly, we should never forget the disinterest of the world that had no room for him. People still show Christ that same disinterest today. We blow Christ off and we say, uh, not today, maybe later. I'm going to live my life and do what I want to do and hope it works out in the end. It just don't work that way. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No one comes unto the Father unless he comes through Jesus Christ. I wouldn't bank on it. The only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ, that is your only hope. And you can know him, but I wouldn't play around with life. Third, I think we see the foreshadowing of the cross while a baby's sleeping in a manger. There's always prophecy there in the scripture. And fourth, I think we need to be reminded this morning of the simplicity of the gospel. Sometimes we just make this thing way too hard. We make it way too hard. And I just want to remind you this morning that Jesus Christ loves you. If you're doubting that and you don't think that Jesus loves you and that Jesus has a plan for your life, then you just think wrong, and I'm just going to shoot you straight. Jesus has a better plan for you, and that plan is to walk with him and to live for him and to love him and to serve him and to walk in his counsel and to walk in his ways and to know him intimately. There's no other way. I mean, if you think about this scripture, that night that happened, Luke chapter 2, verse 7, if you'd walked by, nothing would have screamed supernatural. Mangers, like we said, were not clean, beautiful places. They were lonely, dirty, stinky places made for animals. And if you were looking for Jesus, you wouldn't have started in the nursery. You wouldn't have gone looking for him there if you were one of the, one of the shepherds. If you, if you were looking for Jesus, you wouldn't have gone to one of the hospitals and tried to found, find him in one of the nice nursery suites. You'd go outside in a barn and you'd find the oldest, stinkiest, dirtiest part. And that's where you start looking for Jesus. 
And when you, found the, when you heard the baby's cry, you would know that you had found the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, lying in a manger. He's out in the barn where the animals are, a place we would never put our kids. Sometimes we struggle to put them in. we got a good nursery, by the way. Try it out sometimes if you're afraid to put your kids in there. They're not going to get some kind of disease they'll never be cured of. Okay? It'll build up their immune system if they get a little something. I'll be good for them. All right? But listen, Jesus was born in a place we would have never put our kids. I could see some mamas. I'm not putting my baby in there. Listen. No wonder the world missed him then and still misses him today. It's only by the eye of faith that the majesty of Jesus Christ is seen. And I guess that's my point this morning. What the birth of Christ means is that we have something real and we have something tangible to put our faith in. The birth of Christ implies to us that we must have faith and God has given us what we need to put our faith in. And that is the hope of Jesus Christ. I mean, and we can be indifferent to it all we want. People, people could hear the story a thousand times and never be converted. The Scripture says the unsaved heart is blind and simply cannot see the gospel, but I urge you to see it this morning. God's surprising sign is a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and resting in a feeding trough in a cave behind a village inn where there's no room for him. Not a very likely beginning to a movement that would change the world and still does today. I and mean, what, a, what a rebuke to those who love pomp and glory, to those who despise the small things of the world, to those who can't see the big and the little, because you talk about the big and the little with Jesus Christ. It's been said many times it was a strange way for a Savior to enter the world. Even the poorest of children in that day would have not been found in a manger, but there He was, God's appointed sign from heaven. But you know, God knows what we need. He knows our only remedy for sin is Him. If the world had needed an education, it would, God would have sent a teacher. And if the world had needed an army, God would have sent us a new general. If the world needed more money, God would have sent us a banker. But God knew that the world needed a Savior, and so He came. He came in the form of a baby. And that's the surprise, that's the wonder, that's the delight of Christmas. Did, you know, God did what we could have never done and what we would have never done. He opened the door to heaven for those who believe. And maybe this morning, maybe through Christmas this year, Jesus is just reminding us that He is most important. Not just at Christmas time, how does it impact us today, but all the time. A little baby, a big, huge God. About six months ago, I preached through, um, preached a, a, a sermon from the book of Joshua. And it just, I, I, I kept going back to it this week. And I'm not going to go through it at all. We're nearly done. But I kept going back to it this week about, uh, and some of you may remember this sermon. I called it The God Who Goes Before Me and The God Who Stands Behind. And it was, it was a message about when God used Joshua to lead the people over the river. And in that scripture, if you read through the scripture and you read through Joshua chapter 3 and into Joshua chapter 4, it talked about God's provision, how God was ahead of the people all the time. And there was a certain point in the river where they had to cross over, and it seemed impossible. And look, and you may be there this morning, and you may be standing in front of something, something going on in your life. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And, and it seems insurmountable. It seems like a river you could never cross and something. And, 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 and here's the bottom line. You can't. You can't do it on your own. You need to trust in a God of provision, a God who's always before you making a way. And if you read that scripture, and we won't go into a lot of detail, but it just so happened that God was working before them. 15 to 20 miles up ahead of the river, God stopped the water so that at that very moment the Israelites were able to cross over the river. I mean, it was a God thing. The, the God... A provision was way ahead of them, working way before them. And you look at the Christmas story, you look at the prophecies of the Old Testament, and you've got to remember, God was working way before we thought He was. 
God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he came to this earth and died and, and was born and then lived and then died on a cross for our sins. And the same God that we're trusting in for salvation, when it's all said and done, that we know that we'll be with him for eternity and spend our lives with him, we're trusting him for the provision in the end, but we've got to remember he's the one who set it, uh, set it into work in the beginning. He's the God of all time. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. We trust that God knows what he's doing. So whether it's the Christmas story or whether it's something that you're dealing with in your life, remember that you can trust God. Remember that it's really the only thing you can trust. And walking in his way and walking in his counsel is the only answer that you have. I hope that's what you take with you from the Christmas story. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us, Lord, from your word. Lord, that what we have shared this morning would not go out void. Father, that we would be changed by these truths, these, these life words, God, the truth that you've given us, Lord, in your love letter to us, Lord, from your holy Bible, from your word. God, would you remind us, Lord, that you are the Alpha and you are the Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end. Father, teach us to be thankful for what you have done, Lord, that you chose to come to this earth, to be born in a stinky manger, Lord, to, to live a perfect life, fully God, fully man, Lord, and then you chose to die on that cross for us. Lord, you could have come down. You could have not gone there to start with. But you knew it was the way for humanity to be saved, for mankind to have a relationship with you. The wages of sin is death. That death had to be, that death had to be gone through with. And so, Father, you chose to do it. And, Lord, we praise you this morning and thank you that it didn't stop there that on the third day you rose up from the grave. And God, that your word says you're preparing a place for those who believe. Lord, would you work in this room? Lord, we're going to sing one more song together before we leave this morning. Lord, as we close out 2013, Lord, and as we move toward a new year, Lord, maybe you're just calling us to step it up a notch. Lord, maybe you're calling us to serve you and to live for you and to honor you. Lord, maybe there are some folks in here that are struggling with some deep struggles, God, right now. Family problems, Lord, financial problems, sin struggles, whatever it may be, God. Would you bring us to a place of repentance and hope, trusting in you, knowing that you can change the things we can't change, knowing that you can breathe life and hope into situations that are hopeless and lifeless. God, we put it in your hands. We thank you for this day you've given us. This is a day you've made. We want to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, let's stand together. In the joy of the Lord. Him.